Hello, this is Chef John from FoodWishes.com with grilled salmon with warm bacon and corn relish. That's right, if you enjoy cold, artificially colored pickle relish on top of hot dogs made from recovered meat byproducts, you are really going to love this. And this was inspired by the fact we get so many requests for new and exciting ways to use salmon. And this very easy and summery relish is a great way to do it. And also, did I mention there'd be bacon? Oh yeah, so that's the first step. We're going to slice up some bacon. So I think I have like six strips there. We're going to cut it about a half inch thick. And we're going to throw that in a pan over medium heat. And we're going to cook that fairly crisp. But we're not going to just stand there and watch it cook. Although I have done that before when there's nothing good on TV. But in this case, we're going to use that time to prep our corn. All right, so don't forget about it. Keep an eye on the bacon. But while that's crisping up, let's go ahead and shave those corn kernels off our cobs. And we're going to do that by gripping our ear firmly in one hand and then holding a sharp knife at a 45 degree angle. And you're just going to basically shave those kernels into a bowl. All right, and don't worry about going down too far. We're going to scrape this in a second. And the key thing here to concentrate on is not how much corn you're shaving into the bowl. It's how much fingertips you're not shaving into the bowl. All right, so be very careful. And if that little bit of corn silk I missed is bothering you, don't worry. It actually sticks to the side of the bowl and you can pull it out. It's not a big deal. Don't be afraid of corn silk. And once you've shaved all those kernels off, turn the knife over, scrape the cob with the back of the knife, and you'll get the rest of the kernel and some beautiful, sweet corn juice, which some people call corn milk. You call what you want. You are the SpongeBob of your corn cob. All right, so once we've sliced and scraped two ears of corn into a bowl, we're going to go back and check our bacon, which hopefully is getting crisp by now. And please make sure your bacon gets nice and brown and crispy. You do not want it too fatty. No one's ever had a warm bacon and corn relish and said to themselves, this is good, but I wish it was flabbier. Okay, so make sure you cook the bacon thoroughly. So right there, mine's looking perfect. And at that point, we're going to dump in some sliced green onions and some diced sweet red bell pepper. And obviously, if you want to use a spicier pepper, feel free. That would be delicious. So we're going to saute the peppers and the onion for about two minutes. All right, we don't want it soft and mushy. We just want to take the raw edge off. And at that point, you can go ahead and dump in your corn. And we're going to cook that for just like a minute. We don't really want to cook the corn. We just kind of want to warm it through. And it's funny when I buy corn for something like this because I do prefer the sweetness of the white corn, but the appearance of the yellow corn, which leads to an interesting philosophical argument. Should you always go for taste over appearance? I don't know. We might have to discuss that on the blog post. And at that point, we're going to finish this off with a little bit of seasoning. For me, that was a little salt, pepper, and cayenne. I also threw in another pinch of the green onion, a little bit of the greener parts from the top for appearance. And then last but not least, a little bit of olive oil and a little splash of rice vinegar, which is going to give it that kind of wet, sticky, relish texture I'm looking for. And at that point, you can turn off the heat, stir it around, give it a taste. Maybe you want a little more vinegar. Maybe you want a pinch of salt. Maybe you want a little more cayenne. But once you're happy with that, just keep it warm until your salmon is cooked. And yes, you can make that ahead of time and just warm it up when you're ready to serve. All right, so our bacon corn relish is done and it's on to the salmon. So I have two beautiful center cut boneless salmon filet. We're going to put a few drips of vegetable oil on there. Just spread it around with your finger or a brush. Then go ahead and season that generously with salt, pepper, and cayenne. And then I suggest you cook this on a hot charcoal fire for about five minutes a side until it's perfectly medium. And yes, I did the little half turns so I could get those cool grill marks. And then just one quick reminder, when you're grilling salmon after you flip it, in say two or three minutes, you'll see this crevice start to open up, this crack. And that is your window into the salmon sole. And by soul, I mean doneness. All right, that little crevasse will let you peek inside to see how your salmon's doing. And as you know, I like mine about medium. So at that point, by peeking in that crack and feeling it, I decided mine was perfect. So I pulled that one off. This piece was just a hair bigger, so I gave it an extra minute. You got to be prepared to do that kind of thing when you're cooking. And then we're going to head back inside for final assembly. And by the way, always check the fridge. I had two handfuls of leftover raw spinach from a salad. So I used that as a base, totally optional. But I figured, hey, spinach salads a lot of times get warm bacon dressing, so this might work. And then we're going to spoon over that hot, sweet, delicious, warm bacon and corn relish. Maybe finish it off with a little green onion. And that is done. And once you've relished your salmon, it's time to relish your salmon. I just think corn and bacon go so well with salmon. And you can see there why I was peeking inside my salmon. We got that perfect doneness. It flakes easily. Yet the flesh is just a touch translucent inside, just very moist, very succulent. And by the way, you guys got to stop making fun of how long it takes me to get the food on the fork. I'm usually using the wrong hand and trying to look in a viewfinder while I do it. So you'll have to take my word for it. In real life, I'm a fairly coordinated eater. 
I mean, I'm not saying I'm as graceful as those people on Downton Abbey, but I'm pretty good. But anyway, if you're looking for a very vibrant, summery preparation for some grilled salmon, I hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Norwegian butter sauce. That's right, I'm going to show you my take on Sandefjordsmør, which I'm assuming I've horribly mispronounced. But no matter what you call it, this is one amazing sauce. In fact, it's so delicious and beautiful and versatile. I would make this even if it was hard and complicated to do. But it's not. It's actually super simple, as you're about to see. So let's go ahead and get started by showing you just why this is so easy. There's basically just four ingredients. All we're going to need for this is some cold butter, some cream, some Italian parsley, and a couple lemons. And by the way, it's probably worth mentioning that even though I'm going to use freshly chopped Italian parsley, cilantro and dill are also very popular and delicious. And what we'll do to get started is squeeze our lemons into the saucepan, because what I like to do first is reduce this lemon juice on medium until it's almost but not quite gone. And really, the only way to screw up this incredibly simple recipe would be to burn this lemon juice. So don't walk away. This is only going to take a couple minutes. And by the way, there's some Norwegian chefs freaking out right now, because traditionally the lemon juice is added at the end. But as long as we don't burn it, I much prefer this method. Okay, sometimes when I add the lemon juice at the end, by the time I've squeezed it enough so it's tasting right, the sauce gets thinned out a little more than I want. So by reducing it, we get the same lemon flavor and acidity without the excess moisture. So we'll go ahead and let that reduce on medium until, like I said, it almost but not quite disappears. Okay, right here we're getting close. And we could have stopped. But danger is my middle name. Actually, it's Armand. But anyway, I let it go a few more seconds until it looked exactly like this, at which point we are going to quickly dump in our cream. And then what we'll do at this point is raise our heat to medium high, because before we whisk in our butter, we want this to reduce by about half. And I say we're going to reduce by half, but we're not going to go by amounts, we're going to go by appearance. And what we're shooting for here is to reduce the cream until it's thick enough to coat the back of a spoon, which is just about where we're at right now. And for me, that took about five or six minutes. And as you can see here, that's coating the back of a spoon beautifully. And then what we want to do at this point is turn our heat down to low and start whisking in our butter. And how we're going to do that is by tossing in two or three pieces at a time. And as those pieces of butter get emulsified in, we'll toss more in until the butter's gone. And you can't really do this step too slow, but you can definitely go too fast. All right, if we dumped in all our butter at once and the mixture cooled down too quickly, we could have an issue with the sauce breaking. So I guess what I'm getting at is just do it like I'm showing you. So I continued on adding a couple chunks of butter at a time. And ideally we're using Norwegian butter for this, but I'm not sure where to buy that. So I used the next closest thing for me, which was Irish butter. But no matter where your butter is from, make sure you're using unsalted and, ideally, the milk came from cows that were grass-fed, which is not only going to be a lot better for you, but your sauce is going to have a much better, much deeper, beautiful golden yellow color. So I continued on adding butter, whisking it in over low heat until it was all incorporated. And if everything's gone according to plan, your sauce should look something like this. Okay, for me, that is the perfect viscosity. Not too thin, not too thick. And then what we'll do to finish this sauce is go ahead and add some salt. We'll also add a little bit of pepper, which traditionally is white pepper. But I'm going to go with red pepper, also known as cayenne. And then last but not least, we will stir in our freshly chopped parsley. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm using parsley here, but both cilantro and dill are really nice in this. And while not as common, tarragon also very delicious. So that, of course, is going to be up to you. You are, after all, the Ragnar Lothbrook of saucing food that's caught on a hook. So to summarize, any of your fish-friendly herbs will work beautifully here. And then once that's stirred in, we're pretty much done, except, of course, we have to taste this before we serve it. And mostly we're tasting for salt. But if you did want to squeeze a little more lemon in, that's fine. That's just you cooking. And then what we'll do once our sauce is set is keep that warm on the back of the stove while we move on to the fish. And what I have here is a couple salmon filet that I'm going to season up with some salt and a little bit of cayenne, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. And then because we're going to serve this with a butter sauce, I decide to cook the fish in more butter. So I'm going to transfer my salmon into that pan and cook it over medium to medium high heat until it's cooked to our liking. And as you can see, we are and should season the other side. And yes, I see that scale. I'll remove that as soon as I change camera angles. There we go. And as far as how long to cook your salmon, if that's what you're using, 
It's tough to give specific times because it's going to depend on how thick your fillets are. And as you can see, mine were definitely different thicknesses, which does present a challenge. So mostly I go by feel. Although one thing I can tell you is you probably shouldn't use tongs to flip salmon unless you want it to tear. So be careful. But anyway, I went ahead and cooked that salmon until I thought it was perfect. And of course, that thinner piece did finish first. And if you're faced with a similar situation, just keep that in a warm oven until the bigger piece finishes. And speaking of going by feel, I usually use the same test I use for chicken breast. All right, if it's mushy, it's undercooked. And if it's really hard, it's overcooked. But if it sort of springs back enthusiastically, you should be in pretty good shape. And then once our salmon's cooked, we'll go ahead and plate up and ladle over copious amounts of that beautiful, beautiful butter sauce. And then we'll go ahead and finish up with the obligatory, and possibly gratuitous, extra pinch of parsley. And that's it, our pan-roasted salmon with Norwegian butter sauce is done. So let me grab a fork and go in for a taste. And sure, you could just spoon over some melted butter and squeeze a lemon on. But there's just something magical that happens when you take all those same ingredients and emulsify them into a rich, luxurious sauce like this. It's just a completely different experience. So I just really do love this technique. And I'm never not impressed with how it transforms those very simple ingredients into something so special. And not only do I love how this tastes and feels, but this is probably one of the most user-friendly sauces ever. And I'll talk about this in the blog post, but this is a very difficult sauce to screw up. And by the way, if you're sort of envious of that beautiful, moist, glistening salmon, that's what yours is going to look like as long as you don't overcook it, okay? And by the way, if you're curious about those potatoes, those are called turn potatoes. And not to brag, but I'm only one of 11 people left in the world that know how to do those. So maybe I'll show you how to do those one of these days, but probably not. But anyway, that's it. Norwegian butter sauce. Or as I prefer to call it, Sandefjordsmur. But either way, I really do hope you give this delicious sauce a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Grilled salmon with a ginger, basil, garlic glaze. I love these kind of recipes because they're just completely impossible not to make delicious. Go ahead and try. You can do it. All right, so here's the deal. You just grilled this beautiful piece of salmon. Oh my God. Perfect. Good job on the grill marks. You come in the kitchen, you realize I didn't make a sauce. You have five minutes to come up with something. What do you do? What do you put on the salmon? Here's what I suggest. Check it out. We're going to take a saute pan, something small, something wide, put a spoon of brown sugar, some rice vinegar, a little bit of soy sauce, a large amount of sambal that's just chili paste. I have some ginger, pureed pure ginger I'm using because I had it in a tube. You can grate fresh ginger and use that. A healthy dose of finely crushed or minced garlic, all right, and a splash of cold water and all the exact measurements, which are so crucial, will be on food wishes, of course. I want to cook for a minute to kind of meld all the flavors together. And if I don't put the water, it's going to reduce and thicken too fast, okay? Because I want this to be kind of a, you know, a loose, a thin glaze as I pour it over the salmon. So if I don't put the water in by the time it boils here for two minutes, it, like I said, will reduce too much. So bring it to a boil. Give it a stir. Make sure everything's mixed. When it starts to simmer like that and you see those bubbles getting a little bigger and it starts to thicken just a hair, you're pretty much done. This is such a fast, easy recipe, which is why we're doing it, because you forgot the sauce for the salmon. I still can't believe you did that. I'm thinking beer was involved. All right, there we go. Two minutes later, it looks like that. Turn it off. Bring it over to the salmon. Now, if you somehow had an extra minute, and you somehow had a basil plant in your garden, which you really should. You're going to take a few leaves, thinly slice them in ribbons, also known in France as chiffonade. Put the chiffonade of basil over the salmon. Spoon over that hot, spicy, sweet, amazing ginger garlic glaze. It sort of melts the basil leaves. That aroma and flavor come out. It's just, it's hard to describe how awesome this is. I couldn't bear to film me biting this. It would just it would have been too cruel. Either that or I you know, forgot to turn on the camera. And by the way, this is not just an emergency sauce you do when you need you know, something to put over salmon in five minutes. Do this ahead of time. Reheat it. Pour it over the fish. You're good to go. So anyway, I hope you give this super easy, super delicious fish recipe a try. 
By the way, usually I don't photograph in harsh sunlight like that, but for some reason this just seemed like a sunny July afternoon dish, which it was. So delicious. Go to the site, all the ingredients are there, and as always, enjoy. Salsa Baked Salmon Nachos. That's right, I am very excited to be showing you one of my favorite methods for cooking salmon, which I think would be amazing even if we just put it on a plate. But when you factor in the nachofication of this, we're talking about something very special indeed. Plus, we're achieving all this incredible goodness with virtually no effort, which as you may know are my favorite kind of recipes. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by jazzing up some very basic red salsa. And I'm going to go ahead and stir in a little bit of ground chipotle, as well as some cumin. And if you happen to want to do some different kind of spices, or add a few other additional things in here, feel free. I mean, you are after all the PhD of whether to do this just like me. So please doctor this up any which way you want. Although both the chipotle and the cumin are very, very good with salmon. And that's it. Once we've turned our store-bought salsa into something now that's technically homemade, we can set that aside and move on to prepping our baking dish which begins by generously greasing the bottom with a couple tablespoons of olive oil. And by the way, if you think butter would be better, go ahead and use butter. Both will work beautifully here. And then into our baking dish, I'm gonna transfer some red onions, as well as some seeded sliced jalapeno rings, which along with the salsa baked salmon is what we're gonna to top our chips with. And once we have those transferred in and evenly distributed, I think we should season those up with a nice big pinch of salt before placing over a couple boneless, skinless, hopefully center cut salmon filet. And the reason I insist on center cut when I'm at the fish market is that they tend to cook the most evenly and we don't have to worry about it drying out like we would a tailpiece. And please know that any decent fishmonger will prep this exactly how you want, including the exact size and shape, as well as removing the bones and skin. So tell them what you need or show them the video and they will take care of you. And if they don't, you let me know. And then at this point, we're definitely gonna to wanna to generously salt the tops and I do mean generously. All right, these are some beautifully thick pieces of salmon. So to properly season this, we're gonna need more than just a little pinch. And then once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and generously spoon our salsa over the top. And by the way, as long as it has a normal ingredient list and it's made out of actual real food, pretty much any jarred salsa is gonna work for this. In fact, I intentionally chose an unremarkable brand, like Super Basic, and it really did work wonderfully. So don't worry too much about using something fancy. Although having said that, if you did make some beautiful homemade stuff, it would be that much better, which trust me, was already really good. But anyway, once the top of our salmon's covered, we can go ahead and spoon the rest over our veggies. And that's it, once we've done the salsa, this is now ready to transfer into the center of a nice hot 450 degree oven for about 20 minutes or so, depending on the size, or until our salmon is just cooked through and hopefully looks something like this. Oh yeah, those look good and feel good. And since I'm an old pro, I can tell just by squeezing these they're perfect. But feel free to test these with a thermometer and I'd shoot for an internal temp of about 130, which is gonna give you a beautiful, soft, tender, moist texture. And speaking of texture, what I love about this technique is the vegetables basically get like half cooked, right? They're not soft and they're not crunchy. They're in that sweet spot right in the middle, which is why they're gonna work so well as a topping for our chips. So we'll go ahead and start spooning over our peppers and onions, along with, of course, any accumulated juices. Oh, and if you're wondering how long it took me to get those chips exactly where I wanted, it was about 15 minutes, and I have no regrets. And then once that's been applied, I'm also gonna spoon over some freshly diced avocado, which is obviously awesome on chips, but also pairs absolutely perfectly with salmon. So I'm gonna spoon over about a half an avocado's worth, which may or may not have been tossed in a little bit of lemon juice. And then next up, I'm going to scatter on some freshly chopped cilantro, as well as a little bit of sliced green onion, which looks exactly like chives, but it's not. It's just baby green onions, which I like to pick very small. And that's it. Once our chips are dressed, we'll go ahead and top that with our salmon. And don't be a hero. If you need two spatulas, use two spatulas. And then once we have that salsa baked beauty sitting on top, we'll go ahead and garnish with a few extra jalapeno rings if we want followed by a very generous drizzle of sour cream, which is technically optional, but I think is critical to the success of the dish. So I highly recommend you include some of that. And that's it, I'm gonna finish up with a few more green onions that look like chives. 
as well as some fresh lime. And that's it. Our salsa baked salmon nachos are ready to enjoy. And if everything's gone according to plan, and the internal temp on that salmon was about 130, you're going to be enjoying some of the most tender and moist salmon you've ever had. And not just because we didn't overcook it. By following outdated government recommendations to cook it to 145 or 150, but also because this was baked covered in salsa. And it's also that moist cooking environment that's responsible for the outstanding texture. And of course, also taste. Plus, by baking it using this technique, your kitchen is not going to be filled with that same fishy smell that you do get with some baked fish dishes. So not that we need any more. But there's another great reason to do it this way. And even though these nachos don't contain any cheese, thanks to our sour cream addition, and to a lesser extent the richness from the fat in the avocado, these nachos, quote unquote, seem every bit as decadent and satisfying as real nachos. And not that I'm anticipating you screwing this up at all, but if you did for the sake of argument overcook the salmon a little bit, thanks to the moisture from the sour cream and the salsa, and the avocado and the vegetables, you are still going to be enjoying a spectacular dish. And yes, in case you're wondering, to make these even more nacho-like, some refried beans would work, or whole beans. Okay, in general, beans are one of my favorite side dishes for roast salmon. So if you're into them, feel free to add some of those into the mix. Oh, and one of the only things I like better than nachos is chili quiles. And as we eat this, and the moisture from the salmon and the salsa and the sour cream soak into the chips, it actually becomes fairly chili quiles like So I really do enjoy that aspect as well. Oh, and I should mention, this is one of those recipes I categorize as almost keto friendly. Okay, if you made this without the corn chips, and instead substituted some of those questionable tasting vegetable chips, I think this would very much qualify as low carb. But whether you adapt this to your personal lifestyle choices, or you make this as shown in all its high carb glory, either way, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. fresh salmon cakes. That's right, we've done these before, but we've used canned salmon, which is how I normally do it. But every once in a while, I do like to splurge and use fresh fish for this. And if you happen to be wondering what the difference is between salmon cakes and salmon patties, there isn't any. Totally the same thing. In fact, sometimes I'll just call them both salmon patty cakes, which I really think your younger guests will enjoy. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing we're going to want to do is saute our vegetables because these got to cool before they go in the mix. So in a pan over medium heat with a little bit of olive oil, we're gonna saute some finely minced onions, some red peppers, and some celery. You're also gonna wanna throw a nice big pinch of salt in there. So this would be your proverbial, as they say in Louisiana, holy trinity. And we're just gonna cook this until the onions kinda of turn translucent and soften up a little bit, which is gonna take maybe five minutes. And this is what mine look like. And in fact, it looks a lot more golden brown than it really is. That's actually the red pepper kind of bleeding into the onions. So that explains its unusually beautiful color. And at this point, what we want to do is toss in our capers. And I do want to give those a couple minutes saute to kind of dry them out a little bit. I think that kind of intensifies the flavor, turns up the brininess factor a little bit. So we'll stir in those capers. Those were obviously well-drained. And we'll cook those for a couple minutes. And at that point, all you have to do is turn off the heat and let this mixture cool to room temperature while we prep our salmon, which is the next step. So like I said, we're gonna use fresh fish this time. So I have just under a pound and a half of fresh, wild Pacific salmon. And yes, frozen wild salmon is perfect. And all those little pin bones have been pulled out, but we do need to take the skin off, which is super easy, especially in this case, since we don't care what it looks like, we're gonna chop this up. So all I'm gonna do is cut down with my knife like this till I hit the skin, which is very leather-like, it's very tough. So as soon as I feel that knife hit the skin, I'm going to turn it, flatten that blade out, and just cut right across like that. And if you have a little tear, or you don't do it perfectly, or you leave a little too much meat on the skin, so what? You can always trim it up. Very easy to do, okay? You can just go back and get anything you missed if you want. And then once we've removed the skin, we're going to chop this up. But what I like to do before I start chopping is kind of make some large cubes. So I'm just going to slice it across, and then turn it this way, cut it in some big chunks. And then we're going to switch to the old cleaver and use that to do the final chopping until we have something that looks like this. So basically something about the same size you'd use if you were making sausage and you were doing a coarse ground pork, okay? So that looks good. Let's go ahead and transfer that into a bowl and we will start adding the rest of the ingredients. So we'll go ahead and toss in our vegetables, which should be cool by now. 
I'm also going to toss in some finely minced garlic. I intentionally did not cook that with the vegetables. I want that raw in here. And then we're going to add a big spoon of mayonnaise, real mayonnaise. Don't use fake mayonnaise. We'll also add a nice shake of cayenne, a big pinch of freshly ground black pepper. We're also going to need some salt, of course. And then for our binder, just a little bit of panko breadcrumb. Any fine breadcrumb or cracker crumb will work here. I'm also going to throw in a nice big pinch of Old Bay. And I said Old Bay, not really Old Bay. So if there's more dust on the can than spice in the can, go get a new one. And then last but not least, a little touch of Dijon mustard. And at that point, we can mix this thoroughly. And as I mix this up, let me state the very obvious fact that something like this just begs for adaptation. I mean, you go Asian style, Spanish style, Italian style. Just lots of different ways you could flavor this. You guys are the William Blakes of your fresh salmon cakes. So use that poetic license to make this your own. But anyway, we're going to mix that up. And once that's done, let's go ahead and cover that tightly with plastic wrap and let this chill for at least an hour or two before we try to form the cakes. Okay, we want to give those flavors time to meld and for that breadcrumb to hydrate a little bit. So if you just can't wait, you just have a wicked severe case of the munchies, that's fine, you can shape them now. But you'll see, if you pull this mixture out after an hour or two, it will have firmed up nicely and it will just be a lot easier to work with. So I'm going to take a spoon and kind of divide this into four sections. I'm going to do four large cakes. You can do eight small ones. And what I like to do before the final shaping is just kind of portion it into four lumps, four roughly shaped balls. And that way I can make sure my mixture is divided evenly. If not, I can pull some off one and add it to another. And by the way, as you can see, I dusted that plate lightly with panko. And then once those are set, I'm going to give them a little patting down. And we'll dust the tops with a little panko. And like I said, any breadcrumb is going to work. And at that point, we'll grab each one and give it the final shaping. And I want something about an inch thick three quarters to an inch thick. And just like doing meatballs, if your fingers are a little wet, this is easier to shape. And then once you've caked those into patties or patted those into cakes, you have two choices. You can chill them until you're ready to use, or you can fry them now, which is what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna cook those over medium heat and a little bit of olive oil for about, I don't know, I'm gonna totally guess and say about three minutes aside. And I know most of you are gonna cook them through, but don't be afraid to leave them a little medium inside, just like a salmon filet. And another quick tip here, you can kind of see it cooking up the side like a hamburger. And when it looks like it's cooked up about a third of the way, I'll flip it over. And I'll finish the other side. And really, that's it. I guess you could check with the thermometer, but I can't be bothered. So right about here, I thought it was looking pretty good. So I'm going to flip that back over to whatever I think is the best looking surface. And at that point, we're ready to eat. No, you don't have to let it rest. I know, one of those rare times. So I'm going to plate that up, serve it with a beautiful tomato salad, cherry tomatoes, and green zebra. Oh, those aren't unripe. Those are ripe. They're supposed to be that color. And we'll serve that with a nice wedge of fresh lemon and a big old spoon of our famous remoulade sauce, which I can't believe I've never shown you. But don't worry, that's going to be the next video. And I'll finish by garnishing with a little crisscross of chive, you know, in case any food bloggers show up. And that fresh salmon cake is done. I'm just going to dig in after drizzling over a little fresh lemon juice and eating it with our classic remoulade sauce, which is just fancy culinary for tartar sauce. In fact, there's no joke, the difference between tartar sauce and remoulade sauce, a tablecloth. And don't worry if you didn't get that one, very few people did. But old restaurant jokes aside, this really is a magnificent salmon cake. Just a nicer texture, a richer taste, a moister experience. Like I said earlier, I hope you really try to find the wild salmon. All right, you want to stay away from that cheap farm salmon? I mean, come on, if you're buying your salmon at a store that also sells tires and socks, that's really not the stuff you want. So go find some really nice wild salmon, either fresh or frozen, and give these delicious salmon cakes a try. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Creamy salmon leek pasta. That's right, a super easy, super delicious springtime pasta. Not too heavy, not too light. Some would say just right. Hey, check me out, I just busted freestyle. Anyway, not many ingredients, but big time flavor, and here's how you make it. We're gonna throw some butter in a pan over medium heat, and as soon as it melts, we're gonna saute our leeks. So I want you to take a leek and give it a dice. You only wanna use the white parts, the light parts generally. The dark green parts can be a little tough, but if you got a little bit of that, don't worry. I'm also gonna add a big pinch of salt, and we're gonna sweat that over medium heat for about six, seven minutes. So we're not really looking to brown these. We just want them to soften a little bit. They're actually gonna to continue to cook in the sauce. So right about there, mine were looking really good. And at that point, we're going to deglaze with some white wine and a little bit of lemon juice. And by the way, please do not buy and use cooking wine. 
That's for idiots. All right. So walk to the wine department, tell the person you want the best $7 bottle of white wine they have, and that's your cooking wine. Okay. So we're going to dump that in. That's going to bubble up when it hits the hot pan, of course. Give it a stir, and all we're waiting for is for most of that liquid to evaporate, which is just going to take a couple minutes, right? Maybe two minutes. So don't walk away. You don't want to burn it. Just stand there, give it a stir, and when you see that wine and lemon juice almost boiled away, and it kind of looks like that, we're going to add the star of the show, creme fraiche. Now, typically, these creamy seafood pasta sauces are usually made with heavy cream only, but by using creme fraiche, we're going to get that same awesome creamy texture, plus a way more interesting flavor, in my opinion. Creme fraiche has that beautiful, slightly fermented, tangy flavor, like a sour cream, a little bit nutty, very deep and complex, really, really beautiful. Now, just to confuse you, I did put a small splash of cream there just because I had it in the fridge and I didn't want to waste it. It was only like a quarter cup. So you can really use any combination of creme fraiche and cream. The more creme fraiche, the better. And as you know, very simple to make. So check out that video. And then to finish the sauce, we're going to add a little bit of cayenne and then a little touch of tarragon mustard. If you can't find tarragon mustard, you're just going to use a little Dijon and some chopped tarragon. That's easy. All right, once all that's in there, I want you to give it a stir. Reduce your heat to low and just let it sit there while you prep your salmon, okay? And speaking of salmon, I'm using a wild salmon, which is what you want to try to find. A frozen wild salmon is always going to be a better choice than a fresh farmed. And we're just going to go ahead and make nice even slices, somewhere between like a quarter inch and a half inch. I know, three eighths. The shape really doesn't matter as long as they're all about the same thickness. We're going to walk back over to our sauce. We're going to lay that down on top of our sauce. Remember, this is just on low heat, so it should just be barely, barely simmering. We're going to wait about 30 seconds, and we're going to start to kind of move it around a little. And what's going to happen here is as soon as the salmon starts to break up, see right now as you're moving it around, it's still together because the pieces are raw and they still have that raw texture. But as the sauce warms up, the salmon's going to slowly and gently start to cook through. And right about here, you can see as I start to stir, the salmon just starts to want to fall apart. That is done. Stop, turn off the heat, and get ready to finish your pasta. To finish the sauce, I'm going to dump in a nice handful of fresh herbs. Cilantro, in my case, was fantastic. Italian parsley would be lovely. Tarragon, oh man, that would be so good. Thyme, yes. Chervil, absolutely. Can I stop naming herbs now? Yes, I can. So we're going to stir that in. Of course, you're going to taste and adjust your seasoning. You know that. I tell you every video. Now, of course, if you're smart, and since you're watching this channel, I assume that you are, you should, of course, already have your pasta boiling while you're making this simple sauce. So I cook some spaghetti. For you children under five, that is the same thing as spaghetti. So try to time your pasta to be finished the same time your sauce is. Looking good. And should I garnish with a little bit of extra cayenne? What do you think? And that was it. Creamy salmon leek pasta. So easy. So simple. And this is like a one-two punch of deliciousness. You have that creamy, awesome creme fraiche based sauce. All right, creme fraiche is naturally tangy, but then you have that little extra acidic hit from the white wine and the lemon, that earthy sweetness from the leeks. Just a really, really enjoyable sauce. And then that salmon, because we did not overcook it, we just gently heated it in the warm sauce. It's tender, it's just perfect. And for those of you people that are afraid to cook seafood because you're not sure if you're going to overcook it or undercook it, this is perfect. You really can't mess this up. Anyway, I hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. salmon and parchment. That's right, I'm going to show you how to cook fish encased in paper. It is a really cool trick, relatively easy, visually exciting, and that's about it. All right, to do this, the most important thing you need is this large baker's parchment paper. This is the full size, sheet pan size, all right? You can buy rolls at the grocery store, but this is much easier to use. And if you read the blog post, I'm going to give you a couple secrets of where you can find that stuff, possibly for free. All right, so I have two sheets. I'm going to fold those in half. I'm going to crease it right there. And once it's folded in half, I'm going to take the side that has the fold, and I'm going to take scissors, and I'm going to cut like a half circle. So just like when you were a kid and you used to fold a piece of paper in half and cut the heart shape, that's all you're doing here. So I'm going to start off in a general circle shape, and then I'm going to kind of taper it down when I get to the bottom like that. And you can rewind this and check it out. But when you unfold it, you should have basically a heart shape. 
And you can see we're going to have plenty of room to place our fish and vegetables in there. All right, after your parchment paper is cut, I'm going to drizzle mine with some oil. I'm using olive oil. Any oil will work. You can even use butter. And you're going to cover that thing completely. I flipped it over. I spread it on the other side. And that is ready to go. Okay, at that point, I'm going to place down my 8-ounce salmon center cut filet. I'm going to place it in the middle just past the fold. And you'll be able to see the exact position when I pan out. And the beauty of a parchment cooked piece of fish, you can put your vegetable and side dish right in there. So I have some blanched asparagus. I have some boiled potatoes. The asparagus I just boiled for one minute. Just give them a little head start. All right, then you're going to season it. You can use anything you want. Guess what I used? That's right. I had some pastrami dry rub left over. Beautiful on salmon. All right, so I want you to throw down some spices. I want you to salt it generously. And if you have fresh herbs, throw them in. This is a magnificent technique for fresh herbs. All right, I didn't have anything. Actually, that's not true. I had some time, but I didn't feel like time. In fact, I didn't even feel like making a time pun. And then last but not least, I'm going to give mine just a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. And then right here when we pan out, you can see the exact position. So like I said, the salmon's basically in the middle of the half circle right next to the fold. All right, we're going to fold over the other half and then the crimping and the pressing begins. So we're going to start the folding on the left, what we're going to call the rounded side, and we're going to end up at the pointier side. So this is not complicated, but I want you to go slow and just fold up about a half inch to an inch of paper and crease it really tightly and then grab some more about an inch away fold that over give it a really really firm crease so you're going to keep overlapping and folding creasing overlap fold crease overlap fold crease remember this has to hold air so you really want to get it nice and tight and the reason we started on the rounder end is because when we get to that pointy end i want a lot of extra paper to seal it so we're going to keep crimping and folding and folding and creasing and crimping and you should have a decent amount of extra parchment as you can see there i want you to make three or four final folds really really firmly pressed and creased and then that little inch or two left over crease it firmly and tuck it under and that will i promise hold in the air once that's prepped we're going to throw it on a sheet pan and by the way, those of you that requested close-ups of my hairy hand, there you go. You're welcome. All right, so that's ready for the oven. You can see I did two. We're going to pop those in the center of a preheated 400-degree oven for 15 minutes. And they're going to puff up, and it's going to be spectacular. And, of course, I did something you never want to do, never open the oven while they're cooking. But I had to get a shot. Look at that. All right, 15 minutes later, I pulled them out. And as soon as you pull them out, that's what's going to happen. They deflate. They deflate faster than a Cubs fan's hopes after the first week of the season. Now, after 15 minutes with a piece of salmon that big, it's probably still a little medium rare inside. But you're going to let this sit for five minutes. It's going to continue to steam and cook in that parchment. And five minutes later, you're going to have a moist, delicious, amazing, amazing salmon dinner. Now for service, you can just unwrap this and start eating, but I think it looks a lot cooler if you sort of cut open the center and kind of tear it open and all the juices are going to kind of stay in the parchment package. I think it's a lot nicer. I finished mine off with a little bit of fresh lemon. I made a really super light mustard aioli, just very, very light. And then because I did use mustard in the sauce, I topped with some micro red mustard greens. Anyway, there you go, salmon and parchment. Not only is it beautiful, not only is it delicious, it's actually really fun to make. And then there was nothing left to do except eat. Now, I will admit, yours is going to be better than mine because I took like 10 minutes to set up my last shot. Mine was in the parchment like five minutes too long. So it was pretty much cooked through. There wasn't really any sort of, you know, pink in the middle like I generally like my salmon. But it was really, really good. Still very moist. Yours is going to be even better. So check out the blog post. I'm going to tell you how to get parchment paper. And then the rest is up to you. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts. And like I said, lots more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Broiled herb crust salmon. That's right, it's another fish recipe for people that are terrified to cook fish, which I don't understand. So if you're one of those people, you're gonna love this recipe. Super delicious, super simple, and here is how you do it. So I'm gonna start with one of these, which is called a mortar and pestle. You've seen me use this many times. A fantastic tool for this kind of thing. I'm gonna throw in one clove of garlic that's just been roughly sliced, a big pinch of kosher salt, 
and then some fresh herbs. I'm using tarragon and Italian parsley, which are going to go perfectly with our salmon. Once that stuff is in there, I'm going to smash that into a paste, which is going to take a minute or two. And of course, you can do this in a blender if you have to, but you really, really want to get a mortar and pestle if you can. The flavors you extract by crushing are way more intense than those you're going to get with a blender or a knife. All right, that's just how it is. But anyway, you get the idea. We're going to smash that into a paste. And at that point, I'm going to add some Dijon mustard and some regular mayonnaise. No light mayonnaise, please. All right, I'm going to smash that in. So once my Dijon and mayonnaise are completely incorporated, I'm going to go ahead and switch to the old freakishly small wooden spoon because you're not supposed to use metal utensils in one of these. So we're going to switch to a wooden spoon. All right, I'm going to spice this up a little bit with some cayenne pepper and just a small squeeze of lemon juice. Just having a little bit of acid in there and a little bit of heat is really going to round this out. And if you can believe it, our herb crust mixture is done. All right, of course you can taste that for salt and pepper and things like that. That's up to you. As you well know, you're the boss of your... Well, actually, you know what? You're the boss of your everything. I know, it's a lot of responsibility, but it's true. So you're going to taste this and adjust. All right, so that's looking marvelous. I'm going to set that aside and get on to setting up the salmon. And what we want you to get is center cut, wild, not farmed, wild salmon fillets, center cut. I don't want any of those little skinny tails. It's not going to work for this. I want a big, thick piece of salmon. Boneless, of course. The skin is on. All right, I'm going to put that on a foil-lined sheet pan that's been lightly oiled. And all we're going to do is take our mixture and spread it over the salmon. Now, as far as seasoning the salmon, I did sprinkle these with a little bit of salt, but really it depends on how highly seasoned your herb crust is. So you're going to have to adjust that. We already went through that whole you're the boss thing. Now, most of it, as you can see, is going to go over the top but yes, I am going to put a little bit on the sides just to kind of insulate the meat and also for appearances. So just spread a little bit on the sides, but most of it's going on the top. All right, so once our salmon fillets are prepped, I'm going to go ahead and preheat the broiler on high. I'm going to raise the rack up. I want the salmon about eight inches below the heat. All right, and then to give them a little head start, I'm going to go ahead and turn a burner on under the sheet pan until you can hear it sizzling. Okay, because the heat from a broiler comes from the top, I also want the bottom to have a little head start on the cooking process. So that was only like a minute. All right, but it does help us get this salmon party started right. All right, so we're going to broil these on high until it's browned and bubbling and just amazingly delicious looking. And don't be surprised if you stand there the whole time watching it because it's so mesmerizing. And not only that, if you walk away, you'll burn it. So stand there and stare at it. And most home broilers are going to have spots that are hotter than others. So you're going to want to make sure you're turning that around to get nice, even browning. I don't know much, but I do know people do not like uneven browning. All right, so the top's looking amazing. The bottom we gave a little head start to. But the center of the salmon is still probably not cooked. So I want you to turn off the broiler. I'm going to put the oven on 350. And I'm just going to leave it another five or six minutes until it's cooked through. You are going to be the judge of that. All right, I don't know the shape and the thickness of your salmon. I can't give you exact times here. I'm really sorry about that. If you want to use an internal temperature of 130-ish, that would be about perfect. And that's it. How gorgeous is that? Broiled herb crust salmon. Like I said earlier, this is dedicated to all you people who claim not to be able to cook fish. I see you standing there at the supermarket staring at the fish case, your eyes wide open, your jaw hanging, wondering, what do I do with this stuff? If only there was a super simple, flavorful recipe that I could make in like 10 minutes. Oh, that would be great. Well, here you go. Not only does it look good, it is incredibly flavorful. And my favorite aspect, it stays really, really moist. And will this work on other fish? Sure, why not? Ideally, something that has a little thickness to it, like the salmon. You don't want something that's going to overcook before the top gets browned. Anyway, I hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Miso maple glazed salmon. We've done miso glazed fish. We've done maple glazed fish. But we've never done miso and maple glazed fish. And of course, super easy seafood recipes are one of the most popular food wishes of all time. And it doesn't get much easier than this, so check it out. Okay, to make the glaze, we're going to take some miso paste, which I believe is fermented soybeans. This one is called a light yellow miso paste. So most of your larger, fancier grocery stores will carry that. Not that hard to find. To that, I'm going to add some seasoned rice vinegar, some hot sauce. I'm using shiratsa. And for the sweetness, 
some maple syrup. And that's it. Like I said, this is a super extremely easy recipe. So here we have maybe the world's first Canadian Japanese fusion dish. So that's pretty exciting. All right, we're gonna mix that together. Now, you know what? This took me about 20 minutes because I was so stubborn, I refused to switch to a whisk because I had already dirtied the spoon. So I kept stirring and stirring and stirring. And finally, it was smooth. But if you use a whisk, that'll take like a couple seconds. So we're gonna set that aside and it's onto the salmon in a cold saute pan, something with a metal handle. We have to be able to put this under the broiler. I'm gonna take a little bit of vegetable oil and brush it in the bottom. I'm gonna put my salmon fillets right on top. The skin is on that salmon. So skin side down in the pan, heat goes on medium, and we're gonna start searing that from the bottom up. Now I know what you're thinking, why would you start it in a cold pan? Isn't the skin gonna stick? Yes, it is. We want it to stick. You're going to see what happens later. This is a really cool trick, okay? So that's one reason we're doing it this way. The other reason is because we're going to broil this from the top. I want to give the bottom a little head start. Okay, so as soon as that skin starts to sizzle and it looks like that, that's all you need. So that looks good. I'm going to turn the heat off and I'm going to paint on the glaze. Now that looks like it's still frying because the pan retained the heat, but the heat is off at this point. Now we want most of the glaze on the top surface. But if you want, you can put a little bit on the sides, but you don't want a whole bunch running into the pan. So how much goes on here? I don't know. A couple tablespoons, whatever it takes to cover. All right, so that's looking good. That's going to go under a hot broiler. My broiler is set on high. I'm approximately seven inches under the heat. So you're going to have to play this by ear, but you know what? You can figure it out. With that little head start we had by heating the pan from the bottom, mine took about eight minutes or so. But basically it's done when the salmon is just cooked through and the top is lightly browned. Look at that. So pretty. Now as far as serving goes, remember the skin was on there, but we started it in the cold pan. So that skin should be stuck to the pan. And if we take a spatula and go right underneath the flesh, it will separate so easily and you will be able to pull it right off. And it's just such a cool way to do it because you get that extra flavor and moisture from the skin. And yet you don't have to worry about trying to cut it off or peel it off. Just works great. All right, so we're gonna serve that up with some asparagus and lemon. Look at that asparagus side dish. Talk about just phoning it in. All right, here we go, time to taste. Look at that moist, succulent, glistening salmon. Just so beautiful. The saltiness from the miso, the tanginess from the vinegar, that earthy sweetness from the maple syrup. What a great combination with an ultra simple way to cook fish. This is dedicated to you people that keep insisting you can't cook fish. Uh, you can't. So exactly what part of this didn't look like you could do it? It was pretty easy if you ask me. So I hope you give this a try. Go to foodwishes.com for all the ingredients and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Quick cured salmon. That's right, this amazing technique is so fast, it actually takes longer to explain it than it does to do it. And think about it, why pay $25 a pound for Gravlox at that fancy grocery store when you can buy fresh salmon for $25 a pound and make your own? So all right, I'll admit we really don't do this to save money. The real reason is so our foodie friends think we're a badass. So we're gonna get started and the first thing we need is the brine. So into a bowl, I'm gonna pour some fresh cold water. Yes, we're using fresh water this time. And then to that, we're gonna add a whole bunch of kosher salts and a fairly decent amount of white sugar. And we're gonna go ahead and give that a stir until it's completely dissolved. And sure, this would be quicker if we used hot water, but then our water wouldn't have been cold and fresh. But anyway, no worries, because after a couple minutes of stirring, that cloudiness will disappear and it will look like water again. And in the business, we refer to this as a moment of clarity. And once your brine looks like that, simply set it aside while we move on to prep the salmon. And there we go, I have one beautiful piece of salmon and it should still have the skin on it. And I'm gonna recommend you ask the fishmonger for a center cut, all right, that's right in the middle of the filet. Make sure you have them pull those pin bones out or you do that yourself. And because we want some nice uniform thick slices, this piece of salmon's gonna work the best. And then to prep this, here's what we're gonna do. There's a little bit of connective tissue right in the center. You see that little streak down the middle? What we'll do is we'll cut on either side of that right down to the skin, but don't go through and then simply turn the blade parallel to the cutting board and slice it that way. And then we'll go ahead and do the same thing on the other side, keeping the knife between the flesh and the skin. And then once you've done that on both sides, 
Go ahead and slide that knife blade right through like that. And that piece of meat should come right off the skin. All right, and I'm not gonna show it, but I'm gonna do the same thing to the other piece. And then once I have those sections removed from the skin, we can trim it up a little further if we want. You can see that little bit of gray flesh there where it meets the skin. So basically anything that's not that beautiful orange flesh, you can feel free to trim away. And then once any fine tuning trimming's done, we're just gonna turn that piece this way and carefully cut about quarter inch thick slices. And obviously you can cut them thinner if you want or thicker if you want, but if you wanna use my brining times, it's gonna be kind of important you get it similar. So I'm gonna to continue to slice that across. And once our salmon has been sliced, it's time to brine. And I like to do five or six pieces at a time. I mean, I could probably get more in here, but I know doing it in batches works great, so better safe than sorry. All right, you wanna be sure about the cure. So I'm gonna go ahead and place those slices in the brine. And then believe it or not, it's only gonna sit in there for three minutes. It's not called quick cure for nothing. So set your timer for three minutes, and you could probably just let it sit there, but you know me. I can't stand in front of food for three minutes without touching it. So I do move mine around a little bit. Like I said, probably for no good reason. And then exactly three minutes later, we're gonna fish those out onto a rack. Although you could probably just put these right onto paper towels. I just thought the rack would look cooler. But anyway, we're gonna fish those out. And once those have been removed from the brine, very important, we need to pat those dry a little bit. So take a paper towel and kind of blot those off. All right, it's okay if they're moist, you just don't want them wet. And then once all our salmon slices have been cured and patted dry, we're gonna go ahead and put those on a platter. We'll go ahead and wrap that nice and tight with plastic. And then to finish the process, we wanna refrigerate those until ice cold before serving. I would say a minimum of two to three hours, although overnight, I think's much better. As these sit in the fridge, those slices of salmon kinda of continue to cure and you'll even get a little more of a firmer texture. But anyway, we're gonna chill that thoroughly and then it's ready to unwrap and use. And look how beautiful that is. All right, that color's deepened, that texture's firmed up, very similar to a commercial smoked salmon or a gravlax or other type of cured salmon. And because of that salt and sugar in the brine, it's perfectly seasoned. So let's go ahead and unwrap that and start figuring out ways to eat this. One of my favorite and simplest ways is just to put a little bit of ginger, just like a half of a freakishly small wooden spoon, just stir it into a little soy sauce, and then just give that slice of cured salmon a little dip. And that is absolutely fantastic like that. So that's kind of the minimalist approach. All right, if you wanted to go full food blogger, you could serve it as a crudo with a little micro herb salad, maybe a little green goddess underneath, maybe a little grated horseradish over the top. That's another amazing way to enjoy this. And you can really get a good feel for the texture as I cut it with the fork. I mean, it has that firmness like a cured piece of salmon would, but it also retains this incredible suppleness, just a luxurious texture, so nice. Or of course you could just channel your inner New Yorker and do a take on a bagel and lox. That's just a pumpernickel everything flatbread with some cream cheese, a slice of the cured salmon and some chive. And that bite right there is just as awesome as you would imagine. But hey, what are you doing imagining when you can actually experience, okay? So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Bye.